broadcast. Okay. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. If you are joining us today for Summer of Science, you have landed in the right spot. Um, sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once. Apparently, I can't talk and look at my iPad at the same time. So if you are new to Summer of Science, what I want you to do is open up your chat box, hover your mouse towards the bottom of your screen. I see some of you know what I'm going to say because you can also see the slide. Welcome, Eva. Nice to see you back. And Sage, I recognize both of you as being uh, past participants. So what we like to do here is introduce ourselves in the chat box, your name and where you're from. I love to see. Uh, Sarah, we, we usually get some Mainers in our um, cafes. The reason I'm highlighting Maine, you're going to learn our presenter went to college in Maine and I grew up in Maine. So I'm always partial to the Mainers. But welcome. We have Levi from North Troy and Olivia and Elsa is with us today. Thank you all for um, telling us who you are. Oh, we have Palin from Illinois. Awesome. Haley and Corey are both here. So this is great. I'm so glad that you all are able to join us. I'm going to just give it a couple minutes. We are anticipating close to 30 people today. If everybody uh, remembers to come on inside and get online. Welcome, Jack. Uh, Eva, today we usually um, go about an hour. Sometimes we go over, but you can anticipate us wrapping up around two o'clock. Um, but obviously just, just uh, log out whenever you need to. Hope that helps. So I'm gonna go over some of our Zoom protocols um, when we get together for our cafes. So all of you are muted today. You don't have the ability to um, speak using your mic. Those are turned off. But we do give you the opportunity to share your thoughts in our chat box. And I know often our presenters will ask you questions that they'll want your feedback in the chat box. So we use the chat box just to stay on topic. We don't use the chat box to have side conversations or anything like that because we don't want the chat box to be distracting. Any questions that you have for our presenter are going to go in the Q&A box. So questions only um, that you have for the presenter. And as she um, has breaks in the presentation and is ready to take questions, we'll go into the Q&A box to answer them. Um, all questions will be answered before we leave today's meeting. So don't worry, your question will get answered. If you like someone else's question or they have the same question as you, you can actually click on the thumbs up. Um, that upvotes the question. That actually moves it up the rank. But don't worry, as I mentioned, everyone's question will get answered today. So just remember to be courteous and respectful. Um, again, we can't see you. You can only see us. So there won't be any video distractions. Really, the only distraction would come through the chat box. So again, I'll monitor that and I'll let you know if uh, if it's not being used appropriately. But uh, the last few sessions have been awesome. Um, and the chat box is a great way to just engage in with the presenter and in the topic. So hopefully you all will just stay engaged, participate fully. I am about to put in um, the chat box. If you need closed captioning services today, all you need to do is click on the link that I just put in the chat box and that will get you to the live captioning that is provided. So I want to now go ahead and introduce, oh no, actually, before I introduce our presenter, um, many of you know that today's cafe is part of a series, Summer of Science Cafe series. So every Wednesday at one o'clock, we have really good topics being offered. Um, I will say, so next week we have a cafe that's connected to food and microbiology. And then the cool thing, the week after that, the week of July 15th, the cafe is actually part of a week-long series 
called the Natural Resources Management Academy. And so you can come to just the Wednesday Cafe, but better is participating in, in each presentation that we got. All topics are related around natural resource management. So it's a week long, really focused on learning about natural resource. So these flyers that I just showed are online at the link that is on the bottom of the slide. So you can read up about each um, day, what the topic's gonna be and go register. And hopefully you'll all join us for that. So today's topic is protein modification, the fine tuning for a proper cell division orchestra. Sarah Vandal is our presenter and Sarah is a research technician in Jason Stump's lab at the University of Vermont in molecular physiology and biophysics department. She graduated from Colby College in Maine as an undergraduate um, just last year in 2019 where she studied biology with a concentration in neuroscience as well as art. While participating in undergraduate research at school and during summer internships at UVM, she found her passion for research at the cellular and molecular level. She plans to attend graduate school to pursue a PhD in the near future. So let's all welcome Sarah and let's learn a little bit about cell division. Thanks Sarah, welcome. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. And hello to everyone. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen with you all now. Um, alrighty. So uh, as Lauren said, I'm Sarah. I'm a research technician at UVM right now. Um, and I work in the molecular and physiology and biophysics department. And so in this department, we study living organisms. Um, and look at the molecular level to understand how these molecules are moving around, how they're dynamic, and what the physics behind them are, and how those are important for the living organism. Um, so today with that, I'm gonna be talking to you about protein modifications, um, which are the fine tuning um, uh, components for a proper cell division orchestra. And so I thought I'd give a little bit of background information about how I got into research, um, just so you guys know and have you, you guys um, can see the pathways you could take um, to get into research if you're interested. Um, so as Lauren said in my intro, I started off by attending Colby College in Waterville, Maine as an undergrad um, and here I was studying neuroscience and genetics research um, using Drosophila or fruit flies to do that research. Um, while at Colby I gained a lot of um, kind of skills, writing skills and science and lab technique skills um, and a little bit of research experience but I wanted to learn a little bit more about what kind of field I wanted to go into in the future. So I thought I'd try out uh, some other research labs. And so one of the summers um, as an undergrad going into my junior year, uh, I decided to intern at UVM through a program called the Summer Neuroscience Undergraduate Research Fellowship. And so this is a fellowship that's funded by the National Science Foundation. And so this fellowship provided me um, a chance to do some independent research in a lab at UVM um, to gain some experience in research, but also gain a better understanding of what type of people go into research, what kinds of research opportunities there are, um, what kind of research fields are available. Um, and I got to really meet a ton of really awesome undergrads who also participated in the program, as well as a lot of um, graduate students and also postdocs who are uh, people who have completed their graduate degree and are continuing um, research heavy jobs. And so after um, participating in this summer program, I really found that I really, really loved research. And that was kind of the direction I wanted to move into um, career-wise after school. So then after graduating from Colby, I started working in the Stump Lab at the University of Vermont in the Larner College of Medicine. And so here's a picture of uh, my lab and 
all the current lab members. And so the Stumpf lab, we study uh, the mechanisms kind of behind cell division. So this is a picture from a microscope um, of a cell in cell division. And so with that, I'll kind of segue into the focus of this presentation, which is um, the cell cycle. And so I'll move on there. So I'm sure some of you have learned a little bit about the cell cycle previously in biology classes, um, but I'll kind of go through it a little bit again. So the cell cycle is a series of events um, that kind of prepare the cell to go through division. And so it's broken up into four or five steps. Uh, the first step being the G1 phase or the GAP1 phase. And so this is when the cell starts to grow um, in order to prepare its organelles or the components within the cell uh, to divide. And so after this G1 phase, the cell then goes into DNA synthesis or the S phase. And so during this phase, uh, the DNA has, um, is in the form of 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of what we call sister chromatids. And so in order for the cell to then break off into two cells later on, we need to have double the amount of DNA. So each of those cells at the end have the same amount of starting DNA. And so instead of having 46 chromosomes during this phase, we double that. So we now have 92 chromosomes or 46 pairs. So after the S phase, the cell then goes into G2 or the second growth phase. Um, and so the cell here just continues to grow until it's ready to go into cell division. Um, so during these three different phases or steps of the cycle, the cell is in a, a phase or in a state called interphase. And so this is kind of a, a picture of what that looks like under a microscope. So this image is called an immunofluorescent microscope image, um, which means that uh, within the cell, there are many different proteins um, that are involved in cellular processes. And so what we do is we use um, a light tag. So we add this tag onto specific proteins so that when we shine a light under a microscope, uh, these tags will light up the protein that we want to look at. And so here we have these green dots all here, which indicate a protein called KIF-22 um, that has been tagged with a green tag. And so after these three steps of the cell cycle, the cell then goes into cell division. And so cell division is broke up, broken up into two kind of types of cell division. Uh, you can either have mitosis or meiosis, and I'll kind of go through those two types a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but mitosis or cell division is also broken up into its own kind of phases in its own cycle. Um, so here we have more immunofluorescent images of that cycle. And after cell division period, after this phase right here, the cell can either take one of three steps. Um, it can either go into the G1 phase again and move through the cycle again. Um, and a lot of cells that do this are constantly replicating. So those are like your skin cells or hair cells. Um, another option is the cell goes into a phase called G0, which is kind of like a resting phase. Um, once here, a cell can either stay in this phase for the rest of its life or the rest of the human's life. So cells that do that are like your heart cells or some of your neurons, while other cells can go into this phase. And then when they get a specific cue from the cell to restart uh, the division process and cell cycle process, um, they can move out of the G0 phase. And so an example of cells that do this are liver and kidney cells. Um, so with that, what is the main purpose of cell division? And so that brings me to the first poll that I have, 
Um, so the question that I'm posing is, which one of these is not a main purpose of cell division? So there are three main purposes. So I'm asking which one of these is not the main purpose. So there's A, growth and repair of tissues, B, prevention of cells from getting too large, C, reproduction of an entire unicellular organism, or D, formation of gametes, also known as egg and sperm cells. All right, so I just launched the poll. You should see it and make your selection. If for some reason you can't see the poll, you can just put A, B, C, or D in the chat box. So we'll give it about 10 more seconds, see if we can get a few more people to make a selection. If not, it looks like the majority thinks prevention of cells from getting too large. Yeah, so you guys who have said that are correct. Um, that is the correct answer. So prevention of cells from getting too large. The cells will grow, as I said before, during those G1 and G2 phases. And when it's growing, it knows it's gonna go into division. So if a cell um, doesn't plan on dividing, it won't actually grow. Um, so if a cell doesn't need to go into division, it won't even need to get larger at all. Um, so with that being said, uh, I noticed some other of you um, chose the other options and I'll kind of go through why those other options are kind of the main purpose of cell division. Um, so as I said, one of the main purposes is growth. So when we're babies, uh, we have very small bones, small muscles, uh, and not a lot of hair, among other things. And so cell division is important for this, for our bones to get longer, to increase in size, for our muscles to get bigger, and for us to uh, gain more hair. Um, so over time, our cells will divide and keep dividing in order to produce more and more of these types of tissues. Another reason for cell division is uh, for repair. So let's say if you are running outside and you scrape your knee, uh, you're losing some of the cells on the upper um, kind of surface of your skin, some of the upper layer skin cells. And so in order to have your skin be as protective as it can to those other really important um, kind of, whoops, jump forward, um, other important pieces or tissues of your cell, like the blood vessel and fat underneath, um, your body will send out signals for these cells to replicate and fill in the area where uh, you have lost skin cells. Uh, the next main reason for cell division is to create uh, or replicate unicellular organisms. So all around us, there are some bacteria and other organisms that are just one cell, one unicellular organism. And so in order for this cell to replicate or create a kind of daughter cell, um, it needs to divide via cell division. So here we have the parent cell and a little piece of the parent cell buds off off from the main cell and so this bud over here is what is going to be the new daughter cell um, and so that will be its own separate organism and then the last of the uh, main reasons for cell division is to create the sperm and egg cell um, and so this is done through that second type of uh, cellular division process called meiosis and we'll get into that in a little bit, but this is also very important for um, human reproduction or cellular reproduction. So, uh, as I mentioned, there's two types of cell division. Um, the two types of cell division are mitosis and meiosis. Um, both of these types of cell division start off with one parent cells, or one parent cell, as you can see here. And then they go into a process of dividing where the one parent cell becomes two daughter cells in mitosis. In mitosis, these two daughter cells have genetically identical DNA. 
Um, so that's important for any of your tissue cells that need to be exactly alike. Um, while in meiosis, we have one parent cell that divides into two daughter cells, and then each of those daughter cells divide further into uh, two more daughter cells, creating four daughter cells that are not genetically identical. So these have differences in their genes and genetic makeup. And so for meiosis, that's really important for um, sexual reproduction of humans, specifically uh, the egg and sperm cell will create uh, genetically different cells. So that's the reason why your parents have different genetic makeup than what you have. Um, so I see a couple of questions in the question and answer um, that I'll just go through a little bit right now. Um, the first is where do cancer cells fit into your diagram? Um, so cancer cells, it kind of depends on uh, the type of cancer and where the problem that's arising in the cell happens. Um, but oftentimes cancer cells will go through that process, um, that cell cycle multiple times. So there isn't necessarily a place where they stop. Um, instead, they just keep repeating. And sometimes those cells don't need to replicate more and more, um, but they keep doing because they get a cue from another cell or they're damaged or mutated in a certain way that causes them to keep repeating. Um, the next question is, would we die if our cells would never divide? Um, so for that question, um, a lot of the tissues in our body require our cells to divide. And without that, then we can't grow those tissues. So if our cells weren't ever able to divide, um, it's most likely that a baby, um, so an egg and sperm cell, and the zygote or the cell that's created by those two cells together wouldn't be able to divide at the start. So um, actually it would be likely that there wouldn't even be an embryo or a baby that's produced if our cells couldn't uh, ever divide. Um, and then the last question is how do cells know when to divide? So that's a good question and that is what exactly what I'll be getting into in this presentation. So you'll have to wait for the answer of that one. Um, so going through mitosis and meiosis, um, for the purpose of this presentation, I'll focus on mitosis because that's what uh, we primarily focus on in the lab that I work in and what my research primarily focuses on. Um, so like cell division, mitosis is broken up into a couple different phases or stages. And as I said before, that G2 phase, right before we go into mitosis, uh, the cell is in a state called interphase. And so that's before mitosis. And when we get a cue to go into prophase, which is the first step of mitosis, our DNA that's in our nucleus of our cells will start to condense into chromosomes um, and they form pairs called sister chromatids. In this step, we also get the breakdown of the nuclear envelope, which holds all this DNA. And then we also get the formation of what's called spindle poles and spindle fibers that help in pulling and moving around the chromosomes later on in cell division. So the next step is metaphase. And these spindle fibers help push the chromosomes towards the center of the cell along what we call a metaphase plate or the equator of the cell. And once the chromosomes are all aligned here, then the cell goes into a step called anaphase, where the spindle fibers start to pull that, those chromosomes apart. So each side of the cell gets one chromosome of those pairs. And once those chromosomes have been pulled to the poles or the two sides of the cell, then we go into telophase, which is where the nucleus membrane or the nuclear envelope starts to reform around the chromosomes. The chromosomes start to decondense back into their kind of spindly uh, DNA form. And then the cell that was very large starts to pinch off in the middle to prepare to divide. And so this last piece, uh, cytokinesis, isn't technically a part of mitosis but is a separate process that happens after is, and is when the cell 
that was once one cell um, and has the duplicated DNA and organelles um, then divides into two cells to create two identical daughter cells. Um, and so here's a little video of a cell going through mitosis under a microscope. So the same type of microscope, immunofluorescent microscopy, um, as that other picture before. And so as you can see here, the cell is in prophase, it goes into metaphase with the aligned chromosomes, and then splits apart and two cells are formed. Um, so this image is actually really fast, and the cell doesn't actually divide this quickly, but this is just to show you guys. Um, so with that being said, uh, how does the cell know when it's done in G2 phase, so when it's in this interphase, and ready to start mitosis? So it, there are a lot of different cues that it gets from the cell in order to tell it to go into mitosis. So these cues are kind of in the form of a protein and the amount of protein in a cell at a time. So in G1, the cell will have a large amount of a protein called cyclin D that, or also a large concentration of this active protein. Um, whereas when a cell is about to enter mitosis, it increases the amount of active cyclin B protein, um, and that signals to the cell that it's ready to go into mitosis or that phase. And so this is all kind of like, almost like a, a light switch turning on in the cell, where once a cell goes through one phase, then the cell decides to turn on or activate um, this next protein that's important for the next phase. But it's a little more complicated than that because there needs to be some kind of cue for that uh, protein to become activated before going into that phase. So it's kind of like um, a Rube Goldberg machine, if you've seen these before, where here we would have one protein that maybe becomes activated and then that protein sends a signal where it can either activate or inhibit the next protein and then if that protein is activated it can then do the same for the next protein and goes kind of down the line and we call that a signaling pathway and so this is also kind of like an electrical current um, and so this image right here is kind of uh, the signaling pathway for that uh, protein before uh, mitosis happens. So cyclin B, as we showed before, is the protein that's needed for mitosis to happen. So we need to increase the concentration or the amount of that active or activated cyclin B to happen. And once that amount is increased enough, it forms a protein complex or protein-protein interaction with a protein called CDK1. And so those two proteins together are what signal to the cell uh, that mitosis or cell division needs to happen. But before we even get this activated uh, cyclin B, cells, or, or not cells, I'm sorry, uh, proteins need to activate cyclin B or uh, inhibit other things. Um, so here we can see that cyclins, so those previous cyclins like D and F, um, need to activate cyclin B to increase its concentration. Um, also CDC25C needs to activate cyclin B in order to increase its concentration to tell the cell that it's ready to go into mitosis. So now with that, how does one protein activate or inhibit the next one? What kind of cues or things is it doing to a protein to tell it that it's now active? And so the answer for that is protein modifications, which is also known as post-translational modifications or PTMs for short. Um, so post-translational modifications are modifications or chemical adjustments or additions onto a protein. Um, that can change its function or tell the protein that it needs to do something differently. And so in the process of creating a protein, the cell starts off with DNA, 
which is basically kind of like building blocks uh, or instructions of how to make the protein. Um, so a RNA polymerase, a different type of protein, will read this DNA and read the genes on the DNA and create a copy of them called mRNA. And this process is called transcription. So once this mRNA strand has been created, then a ribosome um, comes and reads this mRNA and it creates a sequence of amino acids. So down here, this strand of amino acids is called a polypeptide. And so this process is called translation. And once this strand of uh, amino acids is, is made, this polypeptide, um, that form is called the unfolded protein form. And after that is fully created, uh, then the protein can fold into its kind of mature form where it uh, produces its function. And so post-translational modifications happen after this translation step that's done by ribosomes. Um, so more specifically, I have another poll question for you. Um, the second question is post-translational modifications happen a, right after translation, so immediately when that polypeptide is made, when it's an unfolded protein, B, after the protein is completely for, uh, folded, or C, this can happen anytime after translation, so during that unfolded stage or the folded stage. Okay, I just launched the poll. When does post-translational modifications happen? A, B, or C. And again, if for some reason you can't see the poll, just put your answer in the chat box. This one has less consensus. Let's see, we gotta get some more votes in. We'll give it about 10 more seconds. If you haven't voted yet, try to get your, this one. Make a guess if you don't, if you don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it looks like right now you have the most votes for A. Okay. All right. So the uh, answer to this question is actually C. So anytime after um, the translation period. So technically, if you answered A or B, you're partially correct. Um, so it's actually important for this protein to be able to be modified before and after it's been folded. So sometimes uh, a protein needs to have a modification happen before it's folded that might help it fold, but it's also important for the, cell, uh, the protein to be able to be modified after it's folded. So maybe that affects how it functions with other proteins or other components of the cell. So it actually can happen either time. Um, or if a protein needs to, it can happen both before and after. Um, so there are different types of post-translational modifications um, in a cell. And here's a picture of some of them. Uh, not all of them. There's actually quite a few. Um, and so as you can see here, uh, the modifications happen by adding a specific chemical group onto the protein. So in here we have a phosphorylation modification where a phosphate is added to the protein. Here we have an acetylation where an acetyl group is added to the protein and so on. Um, and so adding these uh, different chemical groups onto the protein can affect uh, how the protein functions. And so these different modifications, each of them can be important for specific functions of the cell. Um, so as you can see here, sometimes phosphorylation is really important for protein-protein interactions, or like we're talking about in this presentation, cell cycle division, um, and also immune response. While other ones like methylation are important for transcription or acetylation is important for DNA repair. Um, and so these different post-translational modifications are not only specific to particular cellular processes or events, um, but can span a lot of different 
important processes for the cell to um, grow, divide, and function properly in the body. So how do these modifications affect the protein? Um, how do we get a change in the protein's function or how the protein interacts with other proteins by just adding a chemical group? So this is because of a change in conformation or a change in shape of the protein when that chemical group is added. So that is a result and results in the change in function of the protein. So as you can see here, we have a picture, uh, a 3D image, I guess it's 2D technically on the screen, but a 3D rendering of the protein um, in gray and then a molecule it interacts with in blue. So before it's modified, you can see that the blue molecule is able to fit in this spot precisely, but it isn't able to bind really tightly with the gray protein here. Um, but when the protein, the gray protein, is nitrated, which is one of those modifications, so a nitrate group is added on to the protein, um, we get a stronger binding of this molecule to the protein. And that could change the protein's function or affect how the protein interacts with this molecule. And so that's kind of a, uh, an example of a minor change in conformation from the modification, but we can also get really large changes in conformation or shapes of the proteins. So in this example, we have a protein called PKA. Um, when it's not phosphorylated, you can see it's pretty large and has this big gap in the middle. Um, but when it becomes phosphorylated, we close this gap and it becomes a lot smaller. And so this kind of change could affect uh, whether or not a molecule can bind in this little area that was once open, or it can affect how the protein fits into other proteins. Um, and so that's the reason why modifications are really important in not only uh, the shape of a protein, but how it interacts later on in the cell. And so to give you guys an example of this in terms of mitosis that we're focusing on, um, we're going to look at cyclin B again. So cyclin B is this really important protein, as we said, that's turned on or activated um, and at high amounts in the cell at the beginning of mitosis. And so when we increase the amount of active cyclin B, that's important because cyclin B needs to form that complex that we were talking about with the protein CDK1. So we have here when cyclin B attaches to CDK1, we get this sort of conformation. And this allows for an opening um, where phosphorylation can occur once these two bind together. So once phosphorylation happens um, onto CDK1, this phosphorylation or modification by adding a phosphate group um, causes a tighter sort of conformation or shape between cyclin B and CDK1. And when they're tighter, this means that CDK1 is now fully activated. And so that means that the cell can then move down the signaling pathway and these complexes can now signal to other proteins that are important for mitosis to start doing their function. And so that brings me to the third poll question. Um, after a protein is modified, it cannot be reversed. Is this true, A, or false, B? Okay, the poll has been launched. True or false? Got a good horse race going here right now. You guys are neck and neck. <laughs> Let's get a few more. Uh, we got one in the chat that's for true. So true has taken the lead by a nose. See if we can get any other votes in. Give it about five seconds. And then we'll end the poll. Doesn't look like any other votes. Oh, in the chat we have a B. So it is fifty neck and neck. So I think you're gonna have to let us know. Yeah. So that's a good, it's a tough question. So I'm, I'm 
I understand why it's 50-50 and it actually makes sense too because uh, the real answer is false. Um, proteins can be reversed, but there are actually some proteins that can't. So this is a little bit of um, true is true in some cases, but for the most part, proteins can be unmodified or those chemical groups can be removed. And so this, uh, these modifications uh, what modifies a protein is called an enzyme. So these are the proteins that can start a reaction. Um, and so in this case, this reaction is adding a chemical group onto the protein. So for example, we have the phosphorylation, which is completed by uh, enzymes called kinases that add the phosphate group onto a protein. But we also have dephosphorylation that can happen. So taking away the phosphate group and those are completed by phosphatases. And so similarly um, for the other modifications, we have other enzymes that do both adding the chemical group onto a protein and removing. And so to kind of show you how this happens, um, we start off with a target protein. So in this case, uh, this one right here, and maybe this target protein needs a phosphate in order to function correctly. Um, so a protein kinase comes in and it takes a phosphate group from a molecule called ATP, which is the energy um, source of the cell. And so once a protein kinase takes off a phosphate group from ATP, ATP then becomes ADP because it only has two instead of three phosphates. And with that phosphate, the protein kinase can then add it to the target protein. And so now this target protein is phosphorylated and maybe now it's activated and can uh, do its function. But once it needs to be turned off, maybe its function doesn't, isn't needed anymore in the cell, um, then a protein phosphatase comes in and takes away or cleaves off this phosphate from the target protein. And so now we're left with the protein that's unphosphorylated or dephosphorylated. Um, so I talked a little bit about the uh, cyclin B that and CDK1 that relies on these type of modifications in order to uh, move the cell into mitosis. But proteins throughout mitosis um, that have different functions in aligning chromosomes or moving chromosomes um, or breaking down the nuclear membrane are also important in, in having modifications happen to them in order for them to complete these functions. And so one of these proteins is called microtubules and they're kind of string-like um, structures in the cell that function kind of like a highway. Um, so other proteins will walk along microtubules in order to transport uh, molecules that are important for certain organelles or cell processes. And so these modifications help in telling what can bind to microtubules and what kind of structures the microtubules will connect. Um, another protein that can be modified during mitosis is histones. So histones are um, positioned within DNA strands that uh, have coiled around it. And so histones are important for the structure of DNA. And during mitosis, modifications help the uh, DNA, modifications to the histones help the DNA uh, wrap around and condense. So the histone modifications are what is causing a DNA condensation into the chromosomes that we see during a uh, prophase. Um, and another protein that relies on these modifications is microtubule associated proteins. So these are proteins that sit along the microtubules and do different functions like preventing other things from walking along the microtubule. Um, and so these modifications aid in that process, but also aid in the organization of these microtubules and the stabilization of them. And then lastly, we have motor proteins. So these are proteins that walk along these microtubules. So they're sort of like the cars on the highways um, that transport different cargo. 
And so uh, modifications to these proteins can help decide uh, how fast these proteins move, um, what kind of things they carry, and whether or not they're able to bind to a microtubule. And so this is really important, and this is kind of where I will continue talking more about because my uh, the lab that I work in studies these motor proteins and specifically one called kinesin. Um, and here's an image of a motor protein walking along uh, a microtubule here. Um, so these strands here and in the background are all microtubules and the motor protein, in this case kinesin, will walk along it carrying what we call a vesicle. And so these vesicles can contain all kinds of molecules that are necessary for a certain um, compartment or organelle of the cell that this kinesin is moving towards. Um, in addition to that though, this uh, cargo that the kinesin is carrying can come in other forms. So not just a vesicle, but it could also be a chromosome. Um, so kinesins, there are a lot of different types of kinesins. Um, there's around 40 or so in your cells. And a lot of them participate in mitosis. So here you can see kind of complicated diagram of the steps of mitosis and all the different kinesins that are involved in different steps. Um, so sometimes kinesins can be involved in one step. So as you can see here, KIF2B is one that's important for prophase and some of the organization of the chromosomes during prophase, while other proteins such as KIF4A um, is important in metaphase, anaphase, as well as telophase. Um, so like any other proteins, post-translational modifications are really important for kinesins and telling them what kind of function they have. So here's a picture of a kinesin called KIF11 um, that has a function during metaphase of pushing the spindle poles, so those things that were at the ends of the cell, um, towards the outside of the cell and keeping them there. And so a modification called acetylation that happens here at this position of the protein helps in um, increasing the amount of time that kinesin can walk along the microtubules and also increasing how much it can carry. Um, so these kinesins um, that are modified aren't only important for mitosis, but they're also found in other cells and other processes of the cell to um, maintain normal functioning of the human body. So some kinesins are important in neuroscience and specifically in neurons. So transporting materials along the neuron from one end to another. And so these modifications help in telling the uh, kinesin how much it can carry, what it can carry, how long it should be moving along there, and um, what speed. Um, and then this is likewise also important in other areas such as immunology where proteins need modifications in order to help them um, signal to other proteins or uh, other cells such as um, immune, immune cells to attack a virus or a bacteria that's harmful to the body. Um, so what can happen when these processes are dysregulated? So what can happen is um, it can cause diseases in some cases. So because these protein modifications are so important to how a protein functions in a cell, sometimes when we don't have these modifications happening correctly, they can cause problems in the cell. And so one example, I'm sure you um, can guess one of the biggest and well-known examples is cancer. Um, so typically in cancer, when a cell divides, um, it'll just continue healthily dividing. But when there's damage that happens to a cell in a normal, um, in a normal case or a cell, this will signal to the rest of the cell or tissue that that cell needs to divide. So we don't have continue uh, division of a damaged mutated cell. But in cancer, 
sometimes if we don't have these modifications, we don't have a cue that signals that this cell shouldn't divide more. And instead, we get this uncontrolled growth of the mutated or damaged uh, cell. Um, although this is one major disease that comes out of dysregulation of protein modifications, other diseases like the neurodegenerative disease, Parkinson's disease, can also come out of this. So as you can see here, we have um, sometimes things can happen and we can have the mitochondria, which is an organelle in the cell that helps generate energy for the cell, could become damaged. And in a normal healthy cell, uh, a protein called parkin, when phosphorylated, will bind to the damaged mitochondria. And once the parkin that has been phosphorylated, so a phosphate group has been added to parkin, binds to this damaged mitochondria, this signals to the cell that it's time to degrade or get rid of that damaged mitochondria. But if we don't get phosphorylation of Parkin, what happens is the Parkin is no longer able to bind to the mitochondria that's been damaged. And so there's no signal to the cell that that mitochondria needs to be degraded. So we get accumulation or a buildup of all these damaged mitochondria. And lastly, um, another example of a disease that can arise from um, protein modifications not being regulated correctly is uh, health, um, heart disease, which can happen from improper DNA methylation, so or uh, too much methylation of the DNA. And so although these are just three diseases that can arise from these modifications, there are others like um, Alzheimer's disease and diabetes that can also result from problems in protein modifications. And so that brings me to the last poll question. Um, diseases can result from A, overexpression or activation of proteins by these protein modifications, B, underexpression, so too little inhibition of proteins by protein modifications, or B, or C, I'm sorry, both. Okay, I just launched the poll. Let's see. Looks like we have a little bit more consensus this time. We have one in the chat that also says C. Okay. So I'll end the poll. And over 90% are saying both. So you guys are correct. Um, diseases can happen from either overexpression of a protein caused by modifications or underexpression or inhibition. Um, so go. And so I kind of wanted to go into a little bit more information about how these problems and modifications can lead to a disease like cancer. So I chose one specific example using a protein called RB that is in everyone's cells. So RB's uh, function is to kind of serve as a gatekeeper or a protector of this door during um, the cell cycle, specifically during S, S phase and G2 phase. It helps in preventing the cell from growing too large. Um, and growing uh, in size out of control. And so what phosphorylates RB is a protein called E2F or an enzyme called E2F. And so when E2F phosphorylates or adds this phosphate group onto RB, this allows RB to um, do its function normally of protecting uh, the door into the next uh, phase of the cell cycle. But sometimes there are there's cell damage or a mutation that causes the cell to stop and just get stuck in a certain phase. So in this case, it's stuck in S phase. And so because it's stuck in S phase, it keeps increasing the amount of cyclin D that's created. So if you remember that chart, cyclin D was one of the proteins that increases uh, during that uh, phase or tells that phase to keep going. Um, so with this increase, in cyclin D that causes more and more E2F 
enzymes to be activated because the cell still thinks that it needs to keep going in this stage. Um, so when more of these kinases are created, that means that more of them are going to be phosphorylating RB. And so when this happens, it's called hyperphosphorylation. And so when hyperphosphorylation happens, this can cause RB to be stuck and it can't uh, complete its job of um, preventing the cell from continuing to grow. And so as a result, um, RB isn't able to function and the cell just keeps growing larger and larger and larger. And that can result in something called a tumor, which is common in cancer. And so we have that uncontrolled growth of a cell. Um, so that's just one example of how a specific modification of the protein can, when disrupted, can lead to diseases like cancer. Um, but this can also ha happen in other proteins, like I had mentioned before, um, like kinesins. And that's kind of one of the questions our lab is trying to answer. Um, so we know that kinesins, all different kinds, are important during mitosis. And mitosis cell division is really important for um, the human body in general. But when mitosis or cell division happens incorrectly or there's uncontrolled cell division, that can lead to things uh, or diseases like cancer. So by looking at how a kinesin is modified, we can see how maybe its, pro its uh, protein function is affected and how if it functions correctly with that modification, that's good for the cell. But if that modification is taken away or prevented, how that affects how the cell grows, divides, and how the tissue is affected. Um, but with this being said, because we know that these modifications have a large role in how uh, our cells grow, divide, um, we can also use these modifications or the proteins called the enzymes that make these modifications to, as, or as treatments for some of these diseases. So in this chart right here, you can see some drug names. Um, these are all drugs that are used for cancer treatment. Um, and they have targets, including the enzymes that phosphorylate different proteins, as you can see here, cyclin B. Um, that we had talked about previously, but some of these drugs also target the proteins that are being phosphorylated themselves. And as you can see on the right, this is an example or a picture of different types of drug treatments or um, cancer treatments that target specific proteins in particular phases of the cell cycle. And so these different treatments are a really good way to target specific proteins that may be at the root of the disease without harming other components of the cells or other tissues of the cells, um, like chemotherapy would do with just um, killing all cells are, that are rapidly dividing. These treatments are very speci specialized and specific. And so with that, um, that was kind of the end of my presentation. And I'd like to thank you all for joining and thank you to my lab and uh, the 4-H Extension and Teen Science Cafe for having me. Um, and I can open up to the questions in the chat box if you yeah. have. So um, I'm going to interrupt for a moment. So before we go to the questions, and you guys can continue to add questions in, we're going to do one <laughs> final poll, because I know some of you need to hop off soon. We always need to get some feedback. So we're going to do our feedback poll, which I just launched before we get into the question. So take the poll, and then if you have a question you haven't put in the Q&A box, go ahead and do that and we'll get to that. So we'll just take about 30 seconds or so and have you guys uh, just give us the answer to the two questions that are here. And again, just write any questions you might have in the Q&A box. I'm going to end the poll in about 10 seconds. So if you haven't answered yet, go ahead and do that. All right, thank you everybody for giving that feedback. So we'll go into the Q&A box. And Sarah, the first question is, is cyclin B still active without being phosphorylated? Okay. So as we talked a little bit about, um, cyclin B 
forms a complex with CDK1. So CDK1 is being phosphorylated um, to help with uh, entry into mitosis, um, but cyclin B actually undergoes a different modification um, by a protein before it. So for example, the CDC25 protein. Um, so it's active when it's modified, um, but unactive when it's not modified. Um, so how did you first get interested in this field? Good question. Um, so when I started school at Colby, I kind of knew I really loved science and I always did growing up, um, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to kind of go down the route of healthcare and, um, or if I wanted to go into research. And so when I was at Colby, I was studying biology, specifically neuroscience, um, and I really loved that, but I still wasn't really sure which path I wanted to go under. So that's when I decided to participate in research at school and then also go into the internship at UVM. And when I went into those um, internships, they had very different uh, research fields that I was looking at. So at school, I was studying um, neuroscience in uh, Drosophila and looking at neurodegenerative diseases in Drosophila flies. Um, while here at UVM, I was kind of studying what I'm studying now. I was working in the same lab that I'm studying now in. Um, and so when I was comparing these two labs, I found similarities in looking at proteins and signaling pathways, um, but there were also a lot of differences. But when I was looking at the two different researches and what I most enjoyed, I really liked understanding how these proteins were interacting with another, one another, how they were all working together to kind of complete this specific process in a cell. And so knowing that, um, I decided to continue down a route that uh, really had me looking at these um, kind of protein functions and interactions. And so that's kind of how I got into the field. Nice. Um, so Elsa asked, what was one of the most interesting things to you that you learned while doing research in the stump lab? Um, so when I first started in the stump lab, I had no idea what a motor protein was or what a kinesin was. Um, so that was all new to me. So, and when I first did learn about kinesins, I just thought there were one or two and they had a very specific function. But um, being, being and working in the stump lab, I've realized how many different types of kinesins there are, how many functions they have, not only during one phase, but also other phases of cell cycle. And it's really been interesting and cool to see that um, other fellow scientists in the lab are studying other kinesins, and they may be finding that these kinesins have um, really specialized functions that are very different from the ones I'm studying or they could have some similarities or they could interact or have um, similar functions that when done together help the cell move through mitosis. So that has been really cool and exciting to me. So how did scientists first discover mods? That's a good question. And I don't know if I have the entirety of an answer for that. Um, I don't know who or how or when they first discovered modifications. Um, but I would guess that maybe uh, they were looking at cells um, during different stages of life or different stages of the cell cycle. And maybe they looked at a specific protein at one point in time and it was doing something for the cell. But maybe when they looked at another point in time, it was doing something else. And, um, or it wasn't doing anything. So maybe they were wondering, well, what changed with the protein? Um, and so maybe that's how they found the modification, but I don't know the exact answer to that entirely. So good question. Um, so next question, could you modify a cell to grow without dividing? Yeah, so we kind of went into that a little bit at the end um, with that RB protein. So um, if there's a mutation in the cell that causes um, those E2F enzymes to become um, overactivated, then those will keep 
causing the cell or sending signals to the cell to prevent them from or prevent RB from stopping cell growth. So that's how the cell could continue to grow and grow. Are connective tissues made of protein or a specific protein? Good question. So um, connective tissues, so all tissues in our body are made out of cells and within cells are molecules called proteins. So connective tissues may have uh, a higher amount of certain proteins um, that make them different from another uh, type of tissue in your body, um, but they're not made just entirely of proteins. Uh, I don't know what this refers to, but hopefully you do. It's just, the question is, can it happen even with fib fibrillin one and two? Um, I have heard of fibrillin 1 and 2, but because I don't study it too much, I don't know too much about it, so I don't know the answer to that question, but I could definitely look it up. Okay. And there's a fun one for our last question. It actually says, just a fun one, what about that dragon that you were sitting on at the stump lab? Why is it there? Yeah, so <laughs> that fun. is a good question. <laughs> yeah, good one. I like that to end the end. I do too. Why was that dragon there? <laughs> so that dragon is actually a lake monster. And I thought so that was I Champ. <laughs> Yep, the lake monster refers to Champ, um, the lake monster that supposedly lives in uh, Lake Champlain, which is a lake right near uh, Vermont. So Yes, this question may have come from someone who does not live here in Vermont and doesn't know about our lore of Champ, who is kind of like the Loch Ness Monster, who lives in our largest lake called Lake Champlain, and you will spot him or her. Is Champ a girl or a boy? No. <laughs> we don't know. Um, but uh, so you will see s images of Champ in various places around Vermont, apparently at the Stump Lab. <laughs> so I would like to thank Sarah so much for her time. I don't know if Sarah, if you've seen in the chat, there have been a lot of thank yous. Uh, many of the participants found this really interesting and fascinating. Um, if I see your email is on this last slide, um, I would imagine Sarah is open to emails if you have questions after, um, especially many of you who might be thinking about going to college soon. And since Sarah just graduated from college a year ago, she'd be a great person to sort of talk to about those pathways. So thank you all for joining us today. Hopefully we'll see you next Wednesday and many more after that. Enjoy the rest of your day and thanks all again for coming. Thank you.